Welcome back to the Charlie Star Podcast, where we dive into all things meta, witchy, new age, astrological, alternative, and spiritual. So today we have here Stephanie. She is a pagan owner of Raven Wisdom. And Stephanie, I'm pulling this from your Instagram bio and also your linked tree. Um, so you are a rune worker, a bind rune and sickle artist, uh, which is also featured. The art is also featured on your Instagram, Raven Wisdom Arts. And then it also says you're a universal heathen, a wild witch, and uh, and is it Saith Thorona? Saith Kona. Dave Kona. Okay, so <laughs> that's a lot. I'm so excited. You guys, um, for my listeners, I met Stephanie. Stephanie, I met you at Crescent Moon Gifts. Stephanie reads next to me um, right now on Fridays. And I'm so glad that I met you. Like, honestly, you're really cool. And I feel, <laughs> I feel like I'm just, I feel so happy that you agreed to do this podcast with me. And I feel like just like, so kind of humbled because I'm just like this little like baby witch and baby <laughs> practitioner and I just started my business and um anyway thank you well thank you for having me and it's such an honor to work next to you and read with you you're so awesome I, I I'm really grateful that the universe has uh, brought us together in this way beautiful uh, crescent moon gifts I really wanted to ask you about your runes you read there's a couple different kinds of runes right so mm -hmm. there's like celtic runes and nordic runes and then you read i still can't remember how to say it the, the futhark yes the elder futhark is what i specialize in although i also read some other runes as well can you tell us about like how you got into that and um why you specialize in the elder futhark runes and kind of your story with runes absolutely I, i'll try to keep a long story <laughs> shorter uh because <laughs> it comes into um ancestral uh background for me as well uh, i am second generation german uh here in the united states um I grew up with a lot of German being spoken in my house, ate lots of schnitzel. And so I've always had this cultural uh, background just growing up, um, connecting myself with my German ancestry. And um, although I'm kind of the black sheep of my family, uh, didn't do a lot of the things. They're very Catholic, very German <laughs> in that way. Uh, and so I broke up with Jesus when I was 18 years old. It wasn't part of anything personal. It was just, you know, I had to follow my own path and my own truth. And um, I went a couple of years religion sober, not really doing much of anything. And then in college, I started learning more about uh, nature-based spirituality, earth-based spirituality, uh, paganism, and uh, witchcraft, uh, which I had been doing divination most of my life, just in silly little ways. As I was a little girl, I would uh, flip coins and heads meant tail or heads meant yes and tails meant no. I would ask questions and do little things. Um, before I broke up with Jesus, I was still playing with tarot cards and oracle cards uh, just because I thought it was fun. And so after a few years, just kind of exploring my spirituality within this uh, earth centric spiritual um, outline of like what um, Wicca with a lowercase w is what I, I like to call it. Um, then I uh, found my way coming back to the runes. I had my own history and my own baggage because of family and stuff with uh, my German ancestry. And so coming back to studying the runes was very healing and, and still is. I, I love being able to introduce people to the runes uh, for that uh, ancestral healing as well. People who are disconnected from that side of their ancestry. But uh, it started with, um, I was working uh, landscaping because I am that Taurus. Um, and I found this perfect little branch uh, in this really busy area. And the fact that it survived, it kind of made it stand out to me. And I picked it up and it made a perfect rune that looks uh, like a crow's foot. Uh, that is the rune Algies. 
And I didn't know that at the time. And I just picked it up. I'm like, oh, you're a little rude. I should really get back into studying my runes. And then the rest, as they say, is history. My whole process of studying the runes was very uh, manipulatory. Um, if um, if you want to hear more about that, um, I... You. I um, got this idea from the book, uh, uh, Taking Up the Runes by Diana Paxson, who is my, that's my go-to book. Uh, if people are listening and they want to know where can I learn more about the runes, that's the book I always recommend. Again, it's uh, Taking Up the Runes by Diana Paxson. Uh, but in her book, she had this idea for like a rune study group uh, that you can do this and can do that. And I was like, yeah, that sounds so great. So I organized a whole rune study group with my friends. And then nobody else did it. <laughs> and it was my my uh, way of keeping accountable. So every two weeks, I would study uh, two runes, and I would go into a lot of really in depth research about the runes. Uh, there, we get the information for the runes from uh, three rune poems. I know it's kind of hard to imagine <laughs> where we get that from, but in each of these different ones, the Anglo-Saxon, uh, the Icelandic, the Anglo-Frisian bind rune poems, we get little glimpses of what each of the runes mean. And these poems literally say, Fehu means cattle, and it's all this poetry, and um, the poetry that can be um, interpreted and understood in different contexts, from history, uh, from the group and the culture of the people. There's a lot of different layers that go into it, which is, I find to be very fascinating. So I studied the rune poems, I studied this book, and history of like lore and mythology, all at this very intensive study for a few months for each and every single of the 24 elder Futhark runes. Uh, like you were saying, um, there are different types of runes. When most people think of when uh, working with like runes for divination, it's the elder Futhark uh, that is the oldest, as the name kind of implies, of the uh, different um, Germanic uh, runes. Uh, yes, there are like... Um, some people like to use the word rune to imply just kind of like a, a symbol that has power, like a sigil or some sort of like um, when we look at the, the um, astrological symbols, right? The symbol of the sun, the symbol of Mercury, the sim uh, symbol of Venus, um, those types of symbols. Um, some people call those types of symbols a rune uh, just to imply a symbol of power. That the Elder Futhark is like an alphabet. Um, it was used for reading and writing primarily, but each character has its own history and lessons that we get from those rune poems to get a little bit more depth of what each of those characters mean. Kind of like how alpha and beta have the different meaning in addition to a sound that they make in an alphabet. It's similar with the uh, Elder Futhark. Uh, but going back to my little story, <laughs> I uh, went into this really in-depth study. Each one of the runes went into all the poetry, went into all of this, these different aspects. And then I ate the runes. Um, I didn't eat rocks, I promise. <laughs> I um, used frosting on some cookies where I drew the runes on them and I did eat them. And then I performed uh, something called Galder which is singing and chanting runes. And so I activated each rune with drumming and singing that particular rune within me. Now, that's not a requirement to learn the runes by any means. Um, I got the idea from Diana Paxson's book and I was just like, yeah, that sounds so great. It's such a different tool than like tarot or astrology or numerology. It feels very embodied to me. And that's why, because I'm of my German ancestry, because of all of that, it felt very right to me to um, initiate into this whole practice of the runes in this very embodied way. So oh I hope that gosh, answers your question. That, no, that is so cool because I I was just like, right before we, we uh, did this podcast, I went and took a walk with my partner outside. Uh, it's kind of a nice day. I recommend it. But like he, I was, I was telling him, I'm so excited to, in, to interview Stephanie. Um, you know, she does, she works with runes and, uh, he was like, well, you know, and I was telling him about your bind work where mm -hmm. you, you know, produce, which you can tell us about in a minute, a little bit yeah. more about that. But, um, I was kind of telling him about that and he was like, oh, well, but like, how would somebody use the, you know, bind, uh, what would we call a bind? What would you call the image that you create? 
a bind rune. Bind we are binding bind rune. the runes together based on their purposes and intentions. Okay. So um, he was like, so how would somebody use the bind rune, you know, in magic, like for a spell or whatever, whatever, whatever. And he was like, I wonder um, if they would like ingest it in their body you yeah. know and, yeah. and so it was so funny that like that I was like he was like could you you know ask her about that like absorbing it absorbing the runes you know and oh yeah I was like, yeah you know I was like I'll see if it comes up and then it, and then it was like <laughs> one of the first things that you mentioned you're like I actually ate <laughs> yeah I, I love sharing that story because some people are a little like some people are a little like uneasy by it and then a lot of the other people are like oh that's so cool because again it's so different than again working with tarot working with uh numerology astrology it's for me uh the runes are my ancestors and so it's a very physical uh working with them it's very physical for me and so to ingest them to have that embodiment it just made a lot of sense for me uh, i think probably my ancestors were doing a lot of that stuff too since it just came so naturally to me that's so cool i think i think also too like since you're an earth sign you know it can it can be like because he's also a virgo rising in a taurus or not a taurus moon a capricorn moon oh. with an aries sun yeah and so you know it, there's some similarities there because it was funny he doesn't really do magic but it was like immediately the thing that he thought of he was like oh you would just you should ingest them that's how that's how you would get it get them yeah magic. Yeah. So well, there's lots so cool. of other ways you can work with bind runes, but we can get into that whenever you want to ask about that, whenever you want to hear about it. Yeah. Tell me about it right now. That would be so cool. That was one awesome. of my questions. Awesome. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the So bind runes. Yes. Where, like I was saying earlier, uh, to bind runes together based off of those purposes and intentions for spell work, for manifestation, uh, one of the most popular bind runes that most people are not aware of is the Bluetooth symbol on everybody's phones and devices. That is a bind rune. Mm. Um, it's the abbreviation for a Viking king of Denmark, uh, Harold Bluetooth. And he had the name Bluetooth because he ate a lot of blueberries. <laughs> True story. And uh, I used to work in the building uh, where they... Um, or for the uh, for the Bluetooth uh, company, and they had Viking stuff all over in there. They're super into it. So I was the owner, and so um, the uh, the combination of those two runes is the rune Burkana, which is the letter B, and Hagalas, which is the letter H. So it's literally Harold Bluetooth. His initials mashed together to make the Bluetooth symbol. Um, so you can use them for like that purpose. Um, I have my own bind rune that is my signature. Uh, it also looks like a little raven. It has the uh, rune Soilu, which is the letter S, and then the rune Inguas, which is I-N-G for my last name, Ingersoll. And so the combination, and then I put some others in there, just, you know, make it look like a cool raven. That's for my signature. It's my business logo. You can create bind runes for that. Um, traditionally, that was what they were most commonly used for actually um, on the different rune stones uh, where they found them. Uh, rune stones are these giant stones all over in Northern Europe, uh, some in Germany, uh, some in the Celtic islands too, because uh, a lot of the Vikings like to go over there and uh, hang out and, you know, share some stuff, <laughs> share some stuff, loose term. But um, they, they see all these Viking st stones, these rune stones that have these bind runes on them, and they were mostly used as their signature. Um, but in modern day, we took upon that concept and we just added to it. So I make bind runes for, you know, again, signatures, people's um, to represent people or I do them for families too, to be kind of like, um, oh, what's the right word? Um, not heralds, but... Um, just the to represent a family lack of better words um you can do them for a different spell work like if you're looking to add more abundance to be more spiritually connected uh to help with journey work to help with whatever it is you're looking for i make them for pretty much anything and everything under the sun within reason of course um i do them on commission um and i will i do them for my clients uh face to face for my readings as well depending on what comes up in the reading a lot of times I will use the runes from my rune cast where I'm doing divination, um, which I can talk more about that too. Um, but using the runes from that cast, 
um, and I, I pushed them all together to help with whatever it is they came in uh, looking for. Like example, um, someone who's looking to you know, find that really important someone in their life. And so we do a whole reading, the runes give their guidance and their clarity of what can help them, where to go, what to do. Maybe now it's the time to put the brakes on, whatever that message is. And then using that runes, the runes that came in there to help bring that person into their life. Okay. And then from there, they can do kind of whatever they want with that symbol, whether it's like carrying it around with them like on a piece of paper or making that out of frosting and eating it or whatever it is that they feel like is that, is that uh, correct you see this right? absolutely absolutely i tell my clients all the time i'm like you could literally throw this in the garbage and it will still do its thing um you can carry it in your wallet if i if i draw physical ones because all the stuff i do online is going to be digital and so i usually recommend like you can put as the background of your phone you can um print it and you can uh, frame it, you can redraw it, put it on an altar. Um, I also am on Redbubble, so I encourage a lot of my online clients, like get as a sticker, stick it on your water bottle, stick it wherever, stick it in a journal. Um, there's so many different possibilities. Um, sometimes you can stick it in shoes um, as you're walking to have that be with you or draw to the bottom of your shoe. You can place it on mirrors. There's lots of different magical um, elements that you can add on top of that bind rune, but it really just depends on whatever you feel called to do. Uh, Cause once they're set in, in motion, cause it's all about your intention of what you, how you bind the runes together. Um, in the heathen community, there can be sometimes people are afraid to do it. It. Um, there's a lot of stories in the poetic data and prose data of people using bind runes to work all sorts of terrible scary things and so they're kind of scared to even touch upon those things I'm like no everything's your intention you talk about woo and magic and all sorts of those things on your podcast and everything comes down to intention right it's less about um, like Every, you know, again, everything comes down to your intention. And if your intention is to cause harm, then yeah, you know, that that's, there's a whole, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Maybe we don't have time for today. <laughs> but, um, you know, again, it just comes down to that intention. And so if you, if you, I don't think you can really mess up with the runes, like some people think they are, unless your intention is to be disrespectful. If you look into runes with like, looking down upon them and disrespectful to them, then they're probably not going to work the same way as somebody who, you know, hey, I may not know everything about runes, but my intention is I just want to help bring, you know, more abundance into my life. And again, I feel like each rune is alive. They are my ancestors and they listen to us and they know what's going on. So. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier with the runes, like being your ancestors. Can you explain like a little bit more about what, like what you mean by that? Or how, how that is yeah um so for me ancestry is not just blood ancestry it's a soul ancestry um when we connect our souls connect with different energy different beings different places different um, instances when people get that feeling of like deja vu where they've known somebody like it's the first time they've met they're like who are you you just seem so familiar um the runes um being our ancestors they were energy beings i really do feel like they are beings in their own right each one has its own lessons and uh memories and the more we work with them the more that we are intertwined with them i feel like so many Many people who have this northern european ancestry whether it be blood or soul ancestry um, this life or previous lives those who have worked with them have had that connection energetically like how we would connect with um like a soulmate like someone we've met in all of these other instances they are just again very physical different than like the intellectual wrappings our brand our brain and that in uh in, excuse me um make our intu uh, intuition work, excuse me. Um, like when you're working with tarot, right? And you see the star card and you start to look at it and start to break down the pieces and the elements behind it. It's all very much activating your intuition through the, through the mind. While for me, the runes are very much like they're physical, they're in, uh, um, 
bringing that form that in a, of in, intuition through like my heart center, through my guts, again, for eating them, haha. <laughs> but uh, in all those other ways <laughs> that they're very physical for us, uh, people like to tattoo runes a lot. And that's a lot of work I do too, as I do tattoo design for a lot of people. I do have a lot of runes tattooed to me and to imbue them into your blood is another form of just that deep, deep connection with the runes that some people don't necessarily realize when they get them tattooed, but that's a different conversation. Um, but whether it be like through that blood work, through that like physical work, when we have that interconnection with them, it's no different than like, again, those other types of soulmates. Uh, they are very alive and very much breathing. And that's when I work with them. It's like working with an old friend, like that soulmate that I have known such a long time. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Going back to what you're saying earlier about people being afraid uh, to use the runes, like to find find the runes and, and things like that. Like, I mean, I think a lot of people are afraid to do magic in general for yeah. that, you know, that reason. It's kind of like, and it's like, it is intention, but also I feel like uh, if you have a very specific thing that you are like wanting to have happen, you know, like say you do like a spell and you're like, I want X, Y, Z to happen. Like mm -hmm. there is a little bit of like, like pause for cause I suppose because it's like okay you want the specific thing to happen at what like at all costs or is the thing that you think you want really the thing that you really want you know so mm -hmm. I feel like there is a lot there is a lot of like you know reason to be like cautious and thoughtful when it comes to like using magic right absolutely like, Absolutely. I, Mike, I always go back to everything is intention because if your intention is to cause harm, then you know what you're doing. Because like I think about people who study martial arts, right? It's all about mind, body, um, spirits, that interconnection, working with that energy, that chi and that flow. And yeah, they're learning how to punch somebody. You know, they're, are they going to go out and start fights? No, it's a whole, it's other practice that goes behind it. But if they're in an instance where they can do something, sometimes you got to punch somebody. Um, I kind of see that way in day-to-day -day life. Um, people don't like to talk about it, but the only thing that really stops a bully is to hit back, is to, you know, meet them at that same place. If you like love and light, that doesn't necessarily work. And that is sometimes why my clients come to see me is because they are dealing with really hard and difficult things and they don't have the right tools. Like you can't necessarily smudge some things away uh, depending on what it is. And so sometimes we just have to be able to meet that same level, but there's nothing wrong with having to hit back. But again, it's what is your intention behind hitting back? Is it to defend? Is it to set a boundary? Like you don't get to treat me like this anymore. Um, Again, everything comes down to that intention. While you may cause physical harm, it's not necessarily like malicious. Like I want to cause harm to you because I want to hurt you because I've got other things going on. You know what I mean? Like it's I'm causing you harm because I'm setting a boundary. Like if you if you continue to do this, I will hit you. <laughs> so it's trying to simplify a very complex and even oh, deeper very. conversation that could probably be a whole other stream <laughs> in and of itself. That's that's why I always go back to everything is intention. Uh, some people like there's one rune in particular that everyone's so scared of. It's called Hagalas. And I was just saying that it's in the bind rune that's on everyone's devices. It is the rune of destruction similar to your tower card but a little bit different um but so many people are so afraid they'll like you put hagalas into your bind rune unintentionally <laughs> now it's going to cause all of these terrible things like no no it's my intention if hagalas ended up being in there it's just helping to move things out of the way so that we can have change which is good change is a good thing it's not yeah. a bad thing so yeah, no, 100%. I actually, like, that's bringing, now I want to, like, tell you this whole story about this uh, Shiva Lingam rock that I carried around in my pocket for, like, mm. a year. And it was, like, <laughs> it certainly helped me uh, get rid of everything in my life that was, like, not working for me that was, like, it, oh, my goodness, that was the biggest year of my life of, like, clearing stuff out. 
And it wasn't my intention because at that point in my life, I was very, I would say like non-aware or non-intentional about my, my life, especially from a spiritual standpoint. Like you were talking earlier about how like you broke up with Jesus and you kind of had a few sort of like a spiritual years. I was mm-hmm. kind of like in that phase. I've noticed that happened a lot with people that are drawn to like the old, um, the old, I, I guess you could say like the old gods or the old energies, the old traditions is that there's like a breaking up with whatever religion you were raised in a period of, you know, just not just like detoxing from that and then starting your new path. And I was like, I was in like the detoxing phase of that. And somebody gave me the Shiva Lingam for listeners, like who, who don't know, like Shiva is, considered the god of destruction amongst many other things but definitely can be tied to like the tarot card or not the um the tower card in the tarot deck and um the what was the rune you said was the rune for destruction hagalas yeah uh that type of energy and i had no idea somebody gave it to me at a bar just she bling them (laughs) nice i was like i was drunk and i was just like telling this person about you know what was going on in my life at the time and they were like here this will help you i just i carried it around for a year and it was like the craziest year of my whole life and i had no idea till like i don't know a few years later when i looked up I saw that uh, Shiva Lingam stone like in a mystic shop and I looked it up and I was like, okay, <laughs> like this is, explains a lot. That's like, really funny. It's great. But yeah, I completely agree. It's it's your intention. It's the energy of like, hey, this this is actually harming me in my life and it needs to be cleared out. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people are just afraid of change, afraid of um, letting go of control. A lot of people come into these different magical practices wanting to gain more control. And the deeper they walk into this path, the more it's about letting go of that control, allowing for that weird divine timing of being drunk in a bar and someone gives you this incredible stone that really transforms your life (laughs) to this divine timing and less about having that control. I know, which, which honestly, okay, so this has been my big hang up with magic. I'm not really a hang up, but like, I feel like a thing that's like, uh, kept me from exploring magic further, um, which is that when it comes to magic and doing spellcraft, um, I'm so like interested by it. And I find it so like, I find it so fascinating and I find it so powerful, um, and empowering but I haven't done a whole lot of spells because I am in the process of learning what you're saying, which is like learning to like, let go of control and learning to not like, um, you know, try and like overly control my life. Like I have my North node in Aquarius. So it's like, it's all about learning to let go of control. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I love that. And I love like leaning into that process and like developing my sort of like faith and trust in the universe to provide, which we've talked about um, at the shop um, before, but I still want to do magic. So that I'm like, because when you go to learn magic, it seems like it's all about uh, creating a specific intent in your life. And so I'm like, okay, well, my, my problem is I'm always like, okay, well, but, but what do I want? Like, Mm mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> that's what it always comes down to for me it's like okay well what what do I actually want to do what do I want to make happen you know and to me like then it, then that gets complicated with my like need for control if that makes sense absolutely I've struggled with that too and again the more I go on to my path the more I learn about how to have that trust in the divine timing so if I may um, another Norse concept is called the web of weird w-y-r-d it's like our word for like mana or prana or just magic um, or that energy and the web of weird um, it's kind of like a spider's web 
And all of these intersecting moments, like a spider's web, are different decisions that we make. In order to do anything in life, we have to make a decision, right? If you decide that you're going to get up and I want to do this today, or I'm going to do that today, everything is woven based off of those decisions. I tell my clients all the time that they are one decision away from completely transforming their life. And it's true. You decide that I want to do this, I want to do that. And so that's the concept of like magic is that we make that decision. I am in a situation that I'm not happy about. So I want to change something and making that decision and then adding the other tools and other things into our magic, right? Help to bring that into manifestation. Because when we talk about like fate and destiny, it's not so much so it's written, so it shall be. Um, when we take that concept of that web of weird, that spider's web, right, and we turn it three-dimensional, that becomes a concept we call Orlog. Now, Orlog has other fate threads, these other spider webs. Those come from our past lives, from our ancestors, trans-ancestral trauma that we inherited from our own family lines. All of these things become factors into this concept of Orlog. So if you want something and you keep hitting this roadblock and like, why do I keep hitting that? That's when we bring in magic because sometimes it's because somebody had some traumatic experience either in a past life uh, an ancestor or this or that all of that can affect our or log and it's just a matter of just having to detangle the knots and that's part of that empowerment is reminding ourselves that I have the decision to change my fate I have the decision to reweave all of these things and that I'm not just subject to fate and destiny as much as like people look at astrology and like, oh, this is this is exactly what's going to happen. Well, that's one influence. You know, we look at our natal charts kind of like as the cards that we are handed at the time of our birth. And then we get to look at those and decide how we want to play those the rest of our lives. Sometimes mm -hmm. understanding those things help us to overcome them. As much as I am that Taurus, I know that I can be that Taurus. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> ooh. Am I staying in a toxic situation because I'm feeling really loyal or like I have to? Oh, red flag. I need to walk away from that and I need to do better and be better. Uh, I see so many people try to even use magic as an excuse for certain things. Um, when it's not, it's all about empowerment, like you said earlier. And I, I firmly believe that. That's why this has been my life path and my focus of my business and do so much because it's this path is so, so empowering. That magic gives us that permission to reweave those fate threats. And then as far as trust goes, right? Because it's not just us affecting our or log because we also have our own God's guides and ancestors who are also helping to trust or uh, weave that, that, uh, that big concept of or log. And so when I come across something and I see something in my or log, I'm like, oh, I want to change that. But then I can also see, oh, my ancestors are already on it, I kind of have to take a step back and let them help me as well. Because I'm not in this by ourselves. No one is in this by ourselves. We have so many God's guides and ancestors, friends, animals, energy that are here to help us too. So we don't have to take all of that burden on our own. And I used to do that for a long time, that very stubborn Taurus German who's like, oh, well, just tell me what to do. And I got it. And the harder lesson is, is like, no, we're in here. We're trying to help you take a step back and let us help you. And that's where the trust comes in. Yes, I think so much of my practice since um, of my own spiritual journey has been um, empowering, very empowering, but it's empowering through understanding. You know, I mean, that's why I've loved astrology is because I felt like I still feel like it's such an amazing tool for understanding yourself like you said like you're if you're you know running up against a wall with like trying to go somewhere and you keep hitting a wall over and over again like it's kind of like you could go to magic to try and change it it's almost like you go to magic to try and change it and then as you go to that source that divine source then it becomes revealed to you like 
how, like why this is a tangled mess and you understand all the different parts of it. Yeah. And the empowerment is just, it's through like that understanding, you know, it's not exactly like a machete to like hack through the problems. It's like, mm -hmm. let's untangle this knot and understand it. And that's where the real, real power comes, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And you described yourself as a wild witch. Yeah. And a universal heathen. And so you work with, uh, okay, and then also the Sathor tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that you said was first taught by Freya. And what was the other, was it a, another goddess? Uh, yes. Uh, Gulveg. Yes. Gulveg. So are those, those are Norse goddesses. Yes. Yes. So can you tell, can you tell us a little bit about um, your relationship to the Norse deities? Oh, yeah. So it's a, it's a little bit different for me than other heathens. Um, so universalist heathen means um, I believe anybody can walk this path. Um, uh, and it's Odin is the all father, not the some father. I'm all about inclusivity. Um, doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, um, gender, uh, skin, of, uh, color of skin, or any of those types of things, all are welcome into heathenism. And so I always m want people to know that I am that universalist heathen. Everybody is welcome. Mm -hmm. um, Specifically, I'm a Vana true heathen. Um, there's different types of heathenry. It gets complicated because you're based off of the different uh, groups of gods. You have some that are also true, which are focused on the Asir gods, like Odin and Thor and Frigga and uh, those uh, Heimdall. Those ones we think of when we think of like, uh, um, you know, Marvel and <laughs> comic books and stuff. Those those very, very exciting heroes and stories. Uh, there's also the uh, veneer gods, which is my focus of my um, spirituality. They are more earth based. They are the gods of the Germanic tribes, while the Asir are the gods of the Northmen who live up more north. Like when you think of Scandinavia, that's their gods. Uh, the veneer are more of the gods of the Germanic tribes. Again, I'm German. That's where my family comes from. Um, they're also, that's why um, gods like uh, Freya and Freyr, uh, Nehalenia, Nerthus, uh, Njord, uh, they're not as commonly known because the Germanic tribes didn't actually have a written language. Runes were adopted much later. Um, as far as like writing things down, they use them for other purposes. Um, but as like a lot of people were trying to um, Christianize uh, Europe, they were very secretive of their traditions and often they would uh, create their rune sets out of a nut bearing tree. And as soon as they were done with them, they would burn them just because there were a lot of people who would use that uh, to subjugate, to, to cause harm and to hurt uh, those who were practicing those traditions. Um, so you don't have as much information about the Germanic gods, although you do see some of it uh, bleed over into Slavic paganism, which is another big passion of mine. I think it's so, so cool, especially when you talk about more southern Germany, which is where my family comes from, how you have uh, Frau Holda, Frau Peshta, who are very similar to Baba Yaga, and a lot of those Russian fairy tales and how they came into to being. There's a lot I could talk about that. But to the uh, gods and goddesses I worship and I work with, again, I work with the veneer gods because they are the gods of the Germanic tribes. They're also the gods of the elves. And I only bring this up because I was uh, born with pointed ears. <laughs> no other way to put it other than that. People always ask me, uh, where, where did you get your ears done? And I'm like, yeah. the womb? <laughs> um, <laughs> And there's a whole story about that, but I'll try to summarize it as um, the Northmen, again, when they came down south, uh, you know, warring to see what things they could borrow, you know, loose borrow. And um, they came across the Germanic tribes. Now, uh, in different groups around the world, you'll see certain traits that are much more prolific than others. And usually it's for like beauty, um, like uh, uh, sexuality, for those other like uh, things that people find attractive. Uh, in Germany, too, there is the Hasberg jaw, which I also have too. A Hasberg jaw is just a fancy word for an underbite. <laughs> and but there was this uh, uh, German royal who um, he was a prince of Hasberg, and he was known for his very stylish underbites. And so people in the area were, you know, um, 
having children with uh, people who had underbites. So this one area of Germany, you have like a huge number of people with underbites than any other place in the world. And I see that similarity with people with pointed ears. And so my my personal uh, UPG, unverified personal gnosis, is that when the Northmen came down, they came across a Germanic tribe that probably had a lot of people who were born naturally with pointed ears. It was a thing that was uh, seen as a attractive to uh, that tribe and so they went to war and they eventually started trading their ideas and that became the war between the Asir and the Vanir uh, which is all around Gulbig actually. Um, the way the story goes is that um, as the Northmen came down and first saw the Germanic tribes there was a young woman um, named Gulvig, and her name literally means um, gold lust. She was just so amazed by all of the metal and the gold, specifically bronze, because they weren't working with gold at that time, but all this beautiful gold and bronze. And so she went into their camp and wanted to steal some of the pieces just because she was so entranced by it. And then the Northmen uh, tried killing her three times, and each time she resurrected and was power more and more powerful, and she is considered the first Sekona. She learns her magic from the goddess Freya, again, the Vanir goddess, who's all about magic and sorcery, a witch, uh, uh, a god of witches. And so between the two of them, uh, Odin, who's like, whoa, I'm a god of mystery and I want to learn all of these mystery traditions. Um, Sather is sometimes considered uh, women's magic. Um, but we use that term very loosely nowadays. Uh, it's not really like strictly for women's magic, but it's definitely not for toxic uh, masculinity for sure, because Freya makes Odin dress in a uh, dress like wear women's clothing at the time um, to prove that he could get rid of that toxic masculinity, take rid of uh, that idea of gender and gender ideas, because you can't have that coming into a mystery tradition of life, death and rebirth because what is gender? <laughs> what are these kinds of social concepts and constructs? And so there's a whole other thing I could say about that. But yes, it's originally Gulvig, who was the first. She was burned three times. And Freya, who teaches her and Odin all of the magic and sorcery that is uh, Sather. Uh, Sather is different than other types of magic. Um, there's a lot of books that don't know how to talk about why it's different. Um, it's a lot of dream work is what we do. Um, a lot of trance work. Um, runic work is one aspect, of it, but not the only way. Uh, Sather is the mystery tradition of the Seastris in the Northern perspective. There's a whole tradition of high seats, what we call um, where uh, one person sits in the center of a circle and it's surrounded by these other people who sing at her or, or them, I should say, sing at them while they go into trance. There's different tools that are used, different staves. Um, lots of singing is a huge part. Singing and dreaming and trance work is a lot of what makes uh, Sather different than other types of traditions. Okay, so a uh, sea stress is basically somebody who sees. Is that right? Yeah, a sea estress. Um, I mean, you can say a lot of things uh, are different. There's lots of different words. Um, oh, why am I forgetting their names? Um, the, um, not the Vestal Virgins, um, in, Gre uh, in Greece, in the mountains. Um, anyway, it doesn't really matter. There are different types of seestress, seers, uh, those who look beyond the veil, that high priestess who sits in between the, the realm, between the different worlds. Um, um, yeah, lo there's lots of different words for that type of see seer. So Sathor magic is probably, I'm trying to put two and two together here with what you're saying earlier, would have to do with looking into that web. Yes? Yes, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense and then i i've been fascinated with dreams my whole life and i've i'll write i'll wake up and i'll write my dreams down and like it's it's amazing like i haven't had too much of like sometimes my dreams have come true but um it's less premonition work it's more like astral travel i get yeah. visitations yeah <laughs> that kind of stuff so that would be you know basically all part of say magic 
Yes. 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 There, there are times where I wake up and I'm still so exhausted. I know that I was doing a lot of stuff on the other side. Um, my very first, like, I guess, moment when I knew I was psychic um, was uh, a dream that came true. Um, it was actually a really sad instance. Um, I saw somebody got hit by a car. It was a young uh, mother and her child. And so when I saw that in real life, like it was horrifying seeing that happen. They turned out to be okay. The car wasn't going that fast, but still to see somebody get hit by a car um, was very terrifying. And then the fact that I had seen it in a dream the night before just made me, I'm like, I feel like I'm going crazy. And then finally through my own um, journey through Wicca, through this, through that, and I finally came to find the word Sather. I was like, oh, this is literally what I've been doing my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's German <laughs> like me, oh my gosh, of course. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. So with say Thor magic, because all of that stuff is stuff that I like uh, me too, like I've been doing all my life, like the astral travels and the mm -hmm. visitations from spirits and even people that are still alive will travel to you in the astral realm a lot. But like, anyway, um, uh, but with say Thor, is it specifically, it's specifically connected to some specific deities? Is that kind of what would make it like different than, you know, somebody else who is, you know, seeing things or, do you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, I mean, dream work's not seclusive, like just exclusive to one tradition by any means. People have been doing this stuff all around the world, like for a very, 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 very long time. <laughs> um, the um, I would say yes, it's specific to different gods and goddesses, um, different areas, different regions, different cultures. We just have different words for those things. I've met plenty of people who are also do a lot of dream work and they've had no training and they just did it kind of like I did and so many other people do too. Um, yes, I would say this the goddesses because um, it's Freya, Golvig, Frigga, who is different than Freya. She is... Um, the um, wife of Odin. She's a, a very a mysterious goddess. She is known for knowing much, but says very little. Um, it's also connected a lot with um, just how we view the world. Again, our concepts of like the web of weird, Orlog, um, womb magic, going from womb to womb to womb to womb, all of those different birthing bodies all have this we um, ability to we um, change fate and destiny by weaving those fate threads. So I'd say it's kind of also a technique because um, I talk about these concepts and be like, oh, that reminds me of this, this and this in my tradition. I'm like, yeah, same kind of concept, but a little bit different. This is just how we look at it. And I think that's the, that's the biggest difference. Yeah, it can be really helpful to have a system or a tradition to like put your experiences like into context and like gather more, you know, more techniques or more information or more understanding and a sense of belonging too, because this is yeah. like something that's part of your part of your lineage, really, which is very absolutely, cool. yeah. Is there a um, so is Frigga Frigga would mm -hmm. be the goddess? Would she be like sort of like the patron goddess of that stuff? Like, the dream oh, work, that's the debatable. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It's totally fine. I love talking about these things. Um, my friend of mine just put it best a few days ago, and he was like, Frigga and Freya pretty much run everything, don't they? And I'm just like, yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Not like for everybody, but among, you know, in the Nordic tradition, because uh, a lot of it comes down to uh, different aspects of like that whole weaving and um, uh, weaving and changing those fate threads, the web of weird and the orlog concepts like I was talking about. Um, Freya teaches more of the magic. Frigga has a lot more of the knowledge and she retains a lot of that wisdom within her. Like she's one who keeps the knowledge while Freya teaches us how to enact our own knowledge within us, our own particular magic. That person who um, has like the... Um, it, uh, the library knowledge that it's like uh, encyclopedic knowledge while more of like a hands-on practical approach with Freya um, if that makes sense the two are a little bit different some people see, think they're the same goddess and they're absolutely not they're very 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 different goddesses some people think Freya is just a goddess of sex and um 
sensuality uh, because she is a goddess of love. And whenever I hear those things, it just makes me laugh and I can hear all of my guides just laugh. Just like how so many people think of Frigga as this very like domesticated goddess who's just about babies and marriage and like raising like children and running a household. And I hear them just laugh like, of course, sure. You can think of those things all you want. They're there, sweetie. Now, if you really actually want to learn something, you're going to have to unlearn a few other things. And so uh, especially my work with other uh, heathens, because as a um, as a rune reader, uh, I get a lot of heathens who are like, oh, I've never had a rune reading done before, because there's actually not a lot of us. There's not a lot of rune readers out there. Um, and very few who do rune readings like the way I do. Um, I was touching on a little bit earlier. I do a rune cast, meaning that I take a handful of the runes and then I throw them. And I reinterpret them based on how they land and talk to each other. So every reading is a little bit different. It predates uh, tarot, uh, other forms of divination by like thousands of years. Not that one is better or than others, but it's just a very, very ancient form. And I like to do that very traditional ancient form of that divination because that's what it's, you know, how my ancestors called to me to, to read in that way. And when I do readings for some other heathens, a lot of times I'm just kind of having to dispel a lot of these um, uh, misconceptions and ideas. A lot of them are fueled by toxic masculinity. They like seeing Odin like as if he's on the cover of a heavy metal magazine <laughs> uh, and not actually as like the all father who is a very domesticated God who you'd more likely to see bouncing a baby on his knee in front of the fireplace sharing stories than like you know, fighting zombies in a, a post-apocalyptic world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. When you were talking about like comic book gods, like, yeah. that was funny too. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yes. I work with the Greek deities primarily, though my practice is, has been expanding, but that's a whole nother story. But, um, and there are so many misconceptions about Zeus. Oh, oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> so many. Like, I'm like, I don't yeah. even... Uh, like I don't even want to get into that like, it's just people have their own you know experiences from thanks to the media <laughs> from right. media self-projection um lots of things I see especially in the heathen community of people wanting it to be something and then you're like well actually it wasn't that way at all um our ancestors were much more accepting of different lifestyles and different ways of living life. Like people think of these very toxic ideas and try to project them onto heathenism. I'm like, okay, so a lot of the um, people who practice, um, like they consider themselves like clergy, especially a Freyr and Odin would often devoid themselves of gender. They felt the gender kept them stuck here on Midgard and they wouldn't be able to ascend into the nine realms and beyond uh, these other concepts in uh, um, like the world tree and Yggdrasil. Like they were absolutely doing so much work on the other side, but they often felt that gender kept them stuck. And so they would often devoid themselves either physically um, wearing certain types of clothing, other things like that. Because again, gender is like this social concept <laughs> and they knew that back then and they uh, put it into their practice. Makes so much sense. Yeah, no, that, make, that makes a lot of sense, especially mm -hmm. with what I've experienced of my own personal experience with deities. This makes a lot of sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, we are almost at an hour, so I'm probably going to have to wrap this up uh, to keep my promise to you to end this at three o'clock. But um, where can our listeners find you? You can find me on ravenwisdom.com. That's my website uh, where I talk about all my services and all the things that I do where I'm at. Um, I'm on Instagram a lot. That's where I post all my bind rune art uh, primarily. Um, that's Raven Wisdom Arts on Instagram. Uh, I am on Facebook, uh, but it's mostly for my local uh, community, uh, local people. That's Raven Wisdom Divination on Facebook. Um, I am on Twitter, but I'm not on there very much. <laughs> um, but those are the main places where you can find me. Okay, thank you so much, Stephanie. And um, I'm excited to talk to you more about this tomorrow since we're reading tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.